Thank you for listening to Value-Based Care Insights, a podcast by Lumina Health Partners. In this series, host Daniel J. Marino, managing partner of Lumina, talks to top experts and thought leaders in healthcare to help you navigate on the journey to value-based care in the ever-changing landscape of the industry. The goal of this series is to bring you disruptive success strategies by leveraging Lumina's experiences, stories, and insights from working with health professionals and organizations across the country. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to invite you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and let us know what you think about the episode and any questions that are top of mind. Now let's get started. Hello, everybody. This is Daniel Marino. Welcome to another edition of Value-Based Care Insights. Today, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about provider-sponsored health plans. And it's interesting, if you look around the country, many hospitals, health systems, providers continue to be a little bit frustrated with the ability to be able to align their incentives and really be able to to work through a lot of the economics and the, the clinical activities with payers, frankly. And as much as we've really tried to move into value-based care, that journey has been slow. And in essence, at least many of the the contractual negotiations that we've been a part of, as much as you try to incorporate a value-based care component to that, it still comes down to the fee-for-service negotiations. And it's been really frustrating to many hospitals, to many health systems, to many ACOs, that have achieved some real cost savings or some performance improvements in managing their populations. And the frustrating part with all of that is when the hospital or let's say the clinically integrated network has achieved those cost savings, it doesn't seem like the cost savings has been transferred to the patients, to the employers in the way of, of lower premiums that you know the, the patients or the employers will be paying. It seems like many of these are just going back to the managed care organization of the commercial carriers. So w- what we end up seeing a lot of times, and I think what a lot of the health system executives are concerned about is as they start to create efficiencies in their operations, as they start to improve the clinical quality outcomes for their patients, they want to make sure that patients in their communities are receiving the benefits. The other thing that we end up seeing a lot of times too is when we're negotiating these contracts, many of the carriers are coming back and saying, well, we need to reduce the cost of care and that the employers are complaining because the costs are too high. And a lot of times they're blaming the health systems for that. And many of the health systems, you know, I mean, their costs are high. But as they start to reduce those costs, again, they need to be translated appropriately to the employers and to the patients so that you're working together. So as a result, many hospitals, many health systems, many leaders are looking at alternative strategies. And a not so new strategy that has really emerged over this last probably six or eight months are the increases in provider-sponsored health plans. Now, as you recall, for those of us that have been in the healthcare field for 20, 30 years, provider-sponsored health plans in the early 2000s really took off. And those were the days when capitation was very prevalent, and many of the the hospitals started these provider-sponsored health plans as a way of managing their populations, but many of them didn't do very well. And the reason why they didn't do very well is because many hospital operators were running the health plans. And running a health plan is very different than running a hospital operation. The way you look at, you know, just managing the cost and the risks associated with it and the high cost claims and all of those other elements, you have to have a very focused strategy to be successful if you're gonna run a health plan. So in essence, many of them failed. But what we're seeing now is a reemergence of that as a concept to allow hospitals, to allow networks that have really been successful in reducing costs to really be able to connect with patients, to connect with employers, to be able to reduce or even share the, the premium reductions that they've had, share those directly with their community. 
So with that, I am really excited today to have a colleague of mine join us in this conversation, Cliff Frank, who is a national expert in managed care contracting. He has set up and has operationalized many provider-sponsored health plans for health systems around the country. He's run a few of these, um, as he'll tell you about over the years. Great experience and has seen a lot of opportunities and the challenges with provider-sponsored health plans. Cliff, welcome to our show today. I'm pleased to be here, Dan. Thank you very much. Talk a little bit or share some insights that you've seen recently with organizations who've moved forward with provider-sponsored health plans. So there are a bunch of fairly large provider-sponsored health plans that have been at this for a long time and have the scars and bruises to prove it. The newer crop is really kind of running in the wake of their earlier predecessors because it's a lot easier to start a health plan now than it was 20 or 30 years ago. The costs for getting the claims administration and compliance and, and marketing functions are a lot easier. The, the, data, the, the data handling process is better. The actuarial functions are much more precise. And the, the ba biggest thing is that the technology around early detection, early warning for claimants who may really be headed for big trouble is very much improved over what existed 20 or 30 years ago, where it was basically a dartboard and hope. Yeah, you know, and we work with organizations who set up clinically integrated networks. We've been doing this for 15 years. And, you know, there's a progression there, right? When, when these networks are starting to manage the population, of course, they're, they're managing this around what I call the low hanging fruit or, you know, the easy chronic diseases and, and so forth. But then when they move into that next phase, where they're starting to identify different risk cohorts and then put in interventions to really manage that, I cannot help but think that to be able to really integrate that within a progressive health plan operation just really allows a, a tremendous opportunity to really manage the cost, provide much stronger outcomes to patients right? And just really see a, a, a benefit for all the patients within the network. What we've learned over the last decade is that it's not the high cost patients who burn the health plan resources. Those have already been spent. It's the rising risk that matters. The people who have moved from a four to an eight in, the, in three months or people who have had suddenly um, a brand new cancer or a brand new a uh, complication to a situation that's right for, for intervention and support. Those are the people that are on, on divergent paths that if intervention is well-placed and well-timed by a credible and trusted clinical support system, then better outcomes can be obtained and lower and, and high costs avoided. So when a, a hospital is thinking about moving forward with some type of a provider-sponsored health plan strategy. What are they thinking about, right? I mean, it's, it's a pretty expensive proposition to move into this. Um, you know, in your experience, where have the benefits been? What are they, what's driving some of these decisions? That is the fulcrum between um, which success and failure lies. It's not the how, it's the why. If a if a hospital is simply doing this to drive their own market share, it's probably not gonna work because they're gonna be really good at cannibalizing their existing business and not so good at, can at uh, capturing new business because they're competing with health plans that have broad networks and low prices compared to theirs. It ends up being a um, kind of a slow death spiral. If you don't really think about how you really need to leverage the the products within the health plan that you know you can be creating frankly you're just setting up a situation where you're competing against yourself right that's right if on the other hand it's really part of your primary care expansion strategy it's part of your 
clinical outreach strategy for your service lines, and it's part of your employer engagement strategy so that you're not just talking about um, doing a better job for patients you're already serving, but also expanding your outreach efforts, but in a, in a kind of a bottoms up way, as opposed to a top down, then you've got some, you're at least on the dance floor for uh, several years. Then the question is, is can you manage what you capture? And if you do manage it successfully, then what have you done to your operating entities? Think about managed care organizations that are very well run in Medicare that take out 40% of the inpatient and 40% of the outpatient activity. Is that a good thing or a bad thing if you're, if you're a hospital owner? Well, it depends what you do with the extra capacity you now have. Right. Do you right. manage the facility to that capacity? Do you capture new markets? Do you go after other opportunities that have now been created because you have very good access in your emergency room because they're not not cl uh, cluttered up with patients who didn't really need to be there. Right. Well, and I also think, and that's a great point. I also think it's how you structure the deal, right? Because if the deal is structured around a fee for service reimbursement, there's going to be a significant economic impact to the hospital or the health system by lower with lower capacity. But if you're able to move into more of a full risk component then all of a sudden you have an economic incentive to be able to manage those patients more efficient. Or even if you set up some type of a shared savings type of an arrangement where you're able to split the cost with a self-insured uh, employer, if you will, well, then everybody wins. That's right. So health plans fit into health system strategy differently depending on the why and the where. So if you're a dominant or, or at least strong health system in a secondary market like Tallahassee, Florida, or, or, or so, some uh, Wichita, Kansas, or you know, places that have one or two systems, then this could be a strong play. If yeah. you're simply one of 13 other health plans in the market, it's a long, tough slog to really get anywhere and do anything. So it, yeah. it really is contextual. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So, you know, one of the, the issues that I've heard in, in, in talking with some of the health system leaders, particularly CFOs about this is, you know, they sort of have these love-hate relationship with their commercial carriers, right? I mean, you know, they, they need them because they bring in the business, they provide the revenue, but the, you know, the carriers are, are beating them up with fees and you know, everything that we talked about, right? This, the cost savings aren't, aren't going on there. I know one of the, the concerns that some of the CFOs have is, okay, if we set up these health plans, are we gonna upset the commercial carriers to the point where you know, maybe they're gonna then ratchet down on us even more, either in terms of our reimbursement or maybe you know excluding us as providers in our network. How do you manage through that dynamic as you're starting to build the health plan yet making sure that you're at least keeping some type of a level relationship going with your commercial carriers? That's a real art. I have been in situations where my direct contracting efforts were too successful and a health plan came to the hospital CEO and says, is him or me? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? That could be a nice problem to have. <laughs> well, it wasn't when it was me. Because <laughs> so, the, the hospital CEO said, how big is this ever going to get? As big as big as this help? No. Well, then shut it down. If yeah. That's why I say it's a different strategy if you're a, a, um, a big dog in a small town. If you're a, a dominant or at least important player in a mid-sized city where the health plan can't do without you, your health plan competitor can't do without you, you're safe, no problem. On the other hand, if you're one of seven health systems in Dallas, Texas, and you try and do this, you better be ready for some blowback if you're successful. Now in, in by market segment, the sensitivities are much different. So in Medicare, you know, it's not a big deal. In Medicaid, it's, it's not a big deal. In commercial, it's a real big deal. Yeah. And so that's yeah, where that. those approaches have to be made very carefully. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as 
as we've been talking to folks around the country, it seems like if if um, hospital leaders are in, hospital leaders are interested in this strategy, maybe starting something around Medicare Advantage might be a good place to start, right? Because again, I, I would think the the risk would be fairly low, depending upon what the the Medicare Advantage penetration is in your market. But I think it it would provide an opportunity to begin to, you know, build something and be your proof of concept, right? Well, it's it's a good place to start for like a whole bunch of reasons. The first reason is that unlike when we were doing this 30 years ago, Medicare premiums are now risk adjusted. So if you draw a whole bunch of sick people because they know and love you, you get more money from Medicare right out of the gate. So it's not like you're up, you're, you have a huge risk of adverse selection as killed a whole bunch of health systems years ago in, in, in this business. The second thing is, is you get a lot of business quickly, even from a small population, a thousand lives could be easily be two or 300 admissions. So that, that has an impact and gives you something to work with in terms of your, your services and aligning your incentives and all the rest pretty quickly, pretty early. So all of that is pretty good. And then there are multiple uh, product configurations that you can look at, whether it's a direct contracting with Medicare, a Medicare ACO where you're at risk, or starting your own health plan and with a PPO benefit or an HMO benefit or some combo. Um, all of those have advantages and some disadvantages that you can think through, but they all have um, some impact on your current population that you serve and potential for capturing new patients. Well, and it, I like that a lot because what it also does is, you know, the organizations who've been successful in managing the population, bringing down the cost of care, capturing their HCCs, you know, as you mentioned, which obviously, you know, um, define some of the risk activities. Having a, a Medicare Advantage product that you can actually align with your population, it closes the loop, Cliff, right? I mean, you're able to then ensure that the hospital and the health system can really then transfer those cost savings, the quality improvements, you know, you, directly to the patients who are signing up for that. And I would think too, depending upon the markets, I mean, this could be primed for a lot of markets to really be able to create, you know, a product or different types of products based on what the needs are of the patients. Well, this is exactly what Geisinger does with their health plan. They send their health plan into markets where they do not have a physical presence and just contract, they contract with some providers in the market, they apply some good clinical support and attain a certain level of enrollment and suddenly there's a Geisinger clinic, you know, right down the, right in that new market. Right, um, feeds on itself, right? Well, it does, it sets up a virtuous cycle. Yeah. That's exactly right. And the community is often better served as well because they didn't have enough clinical resources and now there are those clinical resources available to them. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. That's such a great point. So if a hospital or health system was interested in this, you know, what's the first step? What do they have to think about as they begin to outline maybe a strategy going forward? They have to think in, in five-year blocks. If they're looking for something that's going to hit their, hit their bottom line positively in three months, they're looking at the wrong place. This is not an easy strategy. It's a capital intensive strategy because you have to set aside roughly 7% of, your, of, your, uh, of the premium in reserves. So it's not cheap, uh, but the benefits are uh, significant if you do it well. The countervailing problem is what if you do it too well and you, and you don't have a plan for what you're going to do with that capacity that you have. I mean, you right. have to, that's part of the thinking through the process is what if this really works? Right. And what if there's a lot of spillover to our regular Medicare or commercial business? Because one thing we learned is doctors do not practice two ways. 
They don't practice one way for capitated patients and another for fee for service. Nobody's got toe tags to tell them which is which. They practice one way. So if they flip, they're going to flip for everybody. Yeah. If they flip for everybody before you have your health plan grown and in place, who gets the benefit? Right. The carriers, not you. Right. Right. And that's what I think you really want to manage through this. So, you know, as your as organizations are thinking about moving through this um, and they build their strategy, I think the modeling becomes really important, right? So the economic modeling, what the capital investment would be, um, I think the modeling around some level of an impact analysis, right? I think, I think the relationship modeling is, is the most important. What does, what, do this do their, what does this do to their physician relationships? What does it do to their patient relationships? And what new opportunities does this create for partnership opportunities, both economic and clinical, that don't exist today? Yeah, yeah, that's great. And I'll tell you, a lot of times that isn't even taken into consideration. That's sort of the byproduct that comes out of something like this. But when you're, when you're building this, your opportunity to just really connect with the providers, the patients, the employers in the community um, is something that definitely can't be overlooked. But that can, if this, for example, has a governance which involves physicians, which these often do, then if that governance is really just for show, it's gonna blow up because the docs will sniff it out in a heartbeat. Yeah. Re yeah the the organizations that are really vested in physician leadership, which means there has to be a, a, a cadre of physician leaders available, but the organizations that, that invest in that get traction because the doctors can go places with other doctors that the hospitals cannot. Yeah. Well, and I mean, that's just building on the clinical integration model, right? Because that's right. That's right. organizations that are successful in clinically integrated networks or ACOs, they're all physician led and physicians are driving those things. And as you mentioned, they can take these concepts to places that hospital executives can't, but being able to align that with the business people to really leverage the economic opportunities around it, that's where a lot of the success comes from. The conflict comes from if the hospital's big admitter or big admitters are not welcome in the their new HMO because they're big admitters and they're kind of wild and crazy clinicians, um, that sets up a really a set of really hard conversations. Yeah, and, it does. Yeah. And that happens a lot yeah. in these kinds of situations. Different dynamics around that. You know, um, so one of the questions when I was having this um, similar conversation with the CFO not, not too long ago, you know, the, they were concerned about the capital outlay with that. Uh, that would be required to really launch this. Um, you know, are there organizations out there? I mean, I, I've, I've run into a few that are helping to support some of this, whether it's, you know, private equity or, or other organizations that are out there that would help, you know, support some of the capital infusion or, or something in that regard. Have, have you seen a lot of that out there? A lot of organizations or vendors that would help in this regard? Yes, there are several classes. There are health plans that aren't in that market that want to come. There are other organizations that are um, co that will co-sponsor um, because they have health plan infrastructure that they want to um, spread over more lives. Um, so they will come in and take a minority or, or majority position, but they'll they'll um, in many ways have a ticket out, uh, to exit over time. You can even go to a reinsurer who will do what's called a quota share deal mm -hmm. where, where they'll put up the capital for the first couple of years. You'll pay a price for it. You, you essentially rent their dollars, but then that's a lot cheaper than putting up your own dollars. So yes, yeah. there are lots of uh, configurations that are possible. The key yeah. is understanding 
why you want to do what you want to do and what you want to do. And then the how will, will, I mean, that will guide the how do you do it question. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the important point that you've mentioned is this is not a, a short-term strategy. This is a long-term strategy, right? And organizations around the country who've been successful in launching provider-sponsored health plans um, have thought about it in terms of what that ongoing evolution of growth has to be, how you connect with the providers or with the, well, providers, the community, the patients, how you launch different products and basically, you know, manage then the commercial carriers within your market. I think that that's a long-term strategy that organizations really have to think about if they're going to jump into this. Well, there are certainly benefits to doing so more than just financial. Um, if your docs are a little wobbly, um, here's, a, here's a way to, to, to make the patient sticky to the docs through the insurance mechanism. And if your um, specialists are splitters, here's a way for you to kind of, for, for your primaries to influence the, the specialists to say, you got to stick with us because yeah. they're now, you have new sticks and carrots to use in these downstream situations. Well, it, it really creates even, a, like you said, a stronger alignment between the patient and the provider. And at the end of the day, that's where the relationship exists, right? I mean, I've often said, you know, that the carrier is there to help process the dollars and maybe to facilitate the linkage, but the true linkage is between the patient and the physician. I mean, that's really where the link linkage is. Particularly in senior markets, that's especially true. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Well, Cliff, thank you for this. This is a you know a great discussion. I think as we continue to evolve into value-based care and, and value-based contracting, you know, many organizations are looking at different contracting alternatives, and I think this is an an important one for folks to really consider. Any final thoughts or advice you may give to our listeners, especially those that may be considering moving in this direction? Well, I think the point you made at the very front is probably the most important. Setting up a health plan is easy. Running it is filled with um, challenges that, that most hospital-oriented or, or hospital-trained people will not understand let alone successfully address. As much as we like to think um, insurance is all about my mom and a checkbook writing checks to, to providers, it's a lot more complicated than that. And there are kind of wheels within wheels within wheels. And if you can't sort that out, one of, something's gonna fly apart and it's gonna hurt. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Well, thank you again, Cliff. I really appreciate your time. Love to have you back again. Maybe we can talk in a little more detail next time about different health plan products and maybe how we connect, you know, further operationalizing a lot of these strategies with the community. Happy to. You know, in, in closing, Cliff brought up some great points. Um, moving forward with a health plan strategy is really a, a, a long-term commitment. I think it could really complement where an organization is going, especially if you're a hospital or a health system that is moving yourself towards becoming a, a population health organization. Many of them are doing that, where they're focusing on reducing costs. They're focusing on managing the care of the patients, connecting with the patients, focusing on you know, the, the outcomes. And as you do that, you want to make sure that the patient's in your communities benefit from it. Um, the employers in your communities benefit from it. And it's not that the commercials, you know, aren't necessarily aligned with the cost savings. I, I think they are. It's just that their incentives may be slightly different than what the hospitals are. Um, as organizations are, are really considering moving in a provider-sponsored health plan strategy, the economic modeling, really the value around there are what's going to drive the success. I want to thank everybody for listening today. Great conversation, particularly want to thank my guest, Cliff Frank, 
for participating in this conversation. Until next time, I'm Daniel Marino. Thank you. We want to thank you for listening to Value-Based Care Insights Podcast by Lumina Health Partners. Lumina is your partner on a journey to value-based care and all the pivots and challenges our industry faces daily. To learn more about us, visit us on LuminaHP.com. If you found value in today's conversation, subscribe to us on all major podcast platforms, including Apple and Spotify, and leave us feedback. Be sure to check out our show notes at LuminaHP.com slash insights. Join us again where we continue to take a deep dive into what lies ahead and invite conversations with some of our colleagues and industry thought leaders on new trends that are emerging and how we continue to navigate and thrive. Until then, have a great day and stay safe.